Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is the Fire Steel Governor Roundtable with candidate Rob McKenna. We really appreciate candidate McKenna taking the time to be with us today. I'm Kathy Saray Smith, a member of the Fire Steel Advisory Committee and a member of the YWCA Board of Directors for Seattle King and Snohomish County. We are thrilled to be hosting this roundtable today, and I'm excited to be facilitating our conversation. We are joined today by four roundtable participants. Grace Wong is the Public Policy Program Coordinator for the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Rachel Myers is the Executive Director of the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. Diane Douglas is the Executive Director of Seattle City Club. And Anne-Marie Schwerin is the Executive Director of the YWCA of Walla Walla, a Fire Steel partner. Thank you for everyone for being part of this conversation today, and thank you to the technology of Google Plus Hangout and Google Support. For those who may not be familiar with Fire Steel, let me introduce you to our Washington YWCA Advocacy Network. The goal of Fire Steel is to help provide relevant and current information to people who care about issues affecting women and families in our state so that they can get more informed and actively engaged. Firesteel is an interactive platform and today is a really good example of how Firesteel can inform and educate in a participatory way. We hope that there are lots of people joining us today from across the state. How can you actively participate in our conversation today? Following our Twitter conversation by follow, following by using the hashtag YW Hangout. Our Hangout is live on the YWCA website, but you can also view it on the Fire Steel Facebook page, <coughs> Google Plus page, or Fire Steel YouTube page, where you can add your voice by submitting comments and sharing with your network. Lastly, before we begin our discussion, a few words on our framework for today. The goal of today's discussion is to engage candidate McKenna on issues affecting women and families, particularly vulnerable children and families in our state. Issues that have not had as much prominence in gubernatorial platforms or debates thus far. On a national level, the YWCA USA conducted a national survey and found that 80% of women across all divides and regardless of political affiliation agree on many issues. Issues like economic and housing security, health care, and reducing violence against women are top priorities for women nationally and locally. So these are some of the issues we'll explore today. So let's get started with the first question. And Rachel will start by asking a question about how we can continue to support the many social services while balancing our state budget. Rachel? Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you for being here, Mr. McKenna. In order to balance the budget, the state legislature has cut over $10 billion from the state's general fund over the last several years, affecting safety net services, public education, and other public structures that make our state healthy and vibrant. What changes, if any, would you propose to our state's revenue structure? Well, I think that when it comes to revenues, we should be looking at tax loopholes and preferences that are currently on the books. There is a process in place today that requires the regular review of these tax preferences and loopholes by a bipartisan joint committee of the Senate and the House. Tax preferences and loopholes ought to be up for regular review, just like spending, overhead costs, uh, regulations, and everything else should be up for regular review. We ought, we ought to constantly be evaluating how we're expending resources and whether that's an effective expenditure or not. Number two, I, I want to just suggest that we have to be careful when we talk about $10 billion in cuts because that could lead people to conclude that our budget used to be $41 billion in the general fund and now it's $31 billion. Of course, it's never been $41 billion. So when people in Olympia talk about $10 billion in cuts, often what they're referring to is increases that ended up being smaller than they'd hoped that they would be. Uh, or some other reduction that uh, didn't meet the goal they had for it. The state budget has doubled from about $16 billion to $31 billion in the last 20 years. It's forecast to increase 
over $11 billion in the next eight years. That's a 36.5% increase. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind as we think about how we're going to apportion or allocate uh, those uh, growing tax revenues. Uh, and uh, we need to prioritize them in the ways we'll talk about later as I answer other questions. But uh, be mindful of the fact that this is the amount of money that the voters have said they're, you know, they want us to have, whereas the voters have also said they don't want their taxes raised a lot more. Uh, keep in mind that they've, they've cut many taxes on themselves over the last 10 years because they feel like their budgets are being squeezed in their own homes. Uh, recently, for example, uh, cutting a temporary or eliminating a temporary tax on bottled water, soda pop, and candy uh, that uh, they obviously uh, they objected to. So, um, you know, we always have to be sure we can budget within the resources that we have. Unfortunately, the governor's office, uh, her budget office, is forecasting significant growth in tax revenues over the next uh, eight years, even you know, at the moderate or mid-level as opposed to the high forecast or, or uh, a more optimistic forecast. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have a question from Grace of the Washington State Coalition, Coalition on Domestic Violence. Hi there, Mr. McKenna. Um, domestic violence shelters and advocacy programs depend on state funding to support domestic violence survivors and their families. Will you prioritize domestic uh, funding for domestic violence programs and if yes, how? Well, Grace, first of all, I'm really glad that you got to ask this question because it gives me a chance to thank you uh, and all the other leaders in domestic violence prevention and services who have been working for so many years on this issue, including you and others who have agreed uh, to serve and have been serving on my domestic violence advisory committee at the Attorney General's office over the last eight years. When I asked you, Barbara Langdon and many others to serve on that committee back in 2005 or 2006 when we started it up, you didn't hesitate to agree and you've been a great member of that committee ever since. We've been able to pass a lot of laws that have uh, strengthened uh, penalties for domestic violence perpetrators. For example, uh, the work we've done to uh, def you know, define assault by strangulation as a felony, whereas before it was often treated as a misdemeanor. We've been able to expand the use of state shared leave by state employees so they can now donate leave to their colleagues who are, are survivors of domestic violence. So we've done a lot together. And as governor, I'll be able to affect, uh, positively affect services for domestic violence survivors beyond the you know, law enforcement, public safety realm into the budgetary realm. And I'll continue to be a strong supporter of domestic, domestic violence services uh, in, that, uh, in that context, just like I was when I was on the county council and fought vigorously to prevent uh, uh, the executive's proposed cuts to domestic violence contract services with Don, EDVP, and other agencies. So um, what I envision doing, in, you know, in summary, is to take the model that I established in the Attorney General's office of the Domestic Violence Advisory Group and bring that to the Governor's office to advise me on domestic violence policy and budgeting uh, at, when, I'm, when I'm there as Governor. And uh, I look forward to continuing those, those fruitful partnerships uh, in that office just as we've maintained them in the Attorney General's office. Thank you for that answer. In in preparation for our Hangout today, we turned to our online community and asked them what they would like to ask you, and a dominant theme we heard was equal opportunity and pay in the workplace. Here in Washington, women earn just 77% of men's hourly wages, hourly wages, and although the recession hit men's employment numbers harder than women's, the earnings gap has actually widened since 2007. How will you help level the playing field for women and families and ensure equal pay for women for the same work as their male counterparts? Well, uh, first of all, I think educa educational attainment is key, uh, not only for women but for men as well. We have uh, uh, an unacceptably low level of educational attainment in this state. We rank 48th in America in the percentage of people living here who will even attend a four-year college or university. The League of Education voters and others have documented that you know, looking at ninth graders to, uh, last year, uh, looking at all ninth graders in the state, only 18% of them will go on to earn a college degree within six years of graduating from high school. And yet, 
we know in this economy that educational attainment is key to increasing earning power. The earning power of a high school diploma is about half what it was in the mid-1970s. And two out of three new jobs created in uh, this state and in the country by the middle of this decade will require a minimum of a bachelor's degree. So my very strong focus in this campaign on restoring funding to higher education, which has been hit very hard uh, as the legislature and governor have shifted money away from higher ed to other issues, that's key. Reforming and innovating in our public schools is key as well, because too many kids are not graduating from high school on time. In fact, we rank among the bottom third of all states in on-time high school graduation. And too many kids who do graduate are arriving in community college or at university uh, not fully prepared. The community colleges report that 57% of entering community college students have to take remedial reading, remedial math, or both. And that contributes to the low attainment rate in our community colleges, where uh, about one in four students who come in as first-year students ever earn a degree or a certificate. It's not just about college degrees, though. When you look at disparities in earning power, I think you also see women underrepresented in certain high-paying fields, like the career skill fields that we see uh, in, uh, in our state in manufacturing, welding, machinist work, et cetera. So this isn't just about uh, helping more women get into college and succeed in college. Some of them don't want to go the college or university route, but they want to have a family wage job for themselves and their families, and that can be one of the career skill fields as well, one of the skilled careers. But we need to do more to expand access for women to those apprenticeship programs in those skilled areas, whether it's carpentry, ironwork, welding, you name it. They're, they're, women are seriously underrepresented in those fields. They're underrepresented in manufacturing, and that needs to be turned around. One way we can do that is represented by a very successful model that I've gone and looked at uh, at uh, Payne Field. It's administered by Edmonds Community College. It's recently been copied by Renton Technical College, and it's called the Aerospace Training and Research Center. It's in a, housed in a facility on Payne Field uh, near Everett. It's administered by Edmonds Community College, and in 12 weeks, the men and women who I saw there are earning a certificate which qualifies them to go to work in aerospace. Over 90% of them are working in aerospace full time within three months of graduating from that certificate program, and they're, they're earning uh, the, same or the same amounts as far as the research that I've seen from it shows because they're coming out of the same program and their employers, whether it's Boeing or one of the other 649 companies that is in aerospace, you know, will pay them equally because they're coming out with that the same credentialing or certificate. So that kind of model needs to be expanded, not only for aerospace work, but in other areas as well, including mar the maritime trades, where we have just a tiny program available right now, and into other high-skilled areas as well, where frankly, there's a shortage of skilled workers today. Thank you. Now we're going to turn to our YWCA Fire Steel partner in Walla Walla, Anne Marie. Thank you. Uh, and great to see you again, Mr. McKenna. I think you were in Walla Walla last year as the speaker for our Early Learning Coalition luncheon, and that's coming up uh, on Tuesday. So I'm glad I get to ask this question about childcare. Parents working outside the home need affordable quality child care, high quality child care. Right. And this is harder and harder to come by for low income families and we know that without child care many women cannot keep a job. How will you help to provide access to affordable, enriching child care for all families so that parents can work and provide for their children and themselves? Well, we'll continue to support programs offered through DSHS that support uh, child care, particularly in the very earliest years. I'm, uh, by the way, also very interested in maintaining and, and uh, expanding visiting nurse programs for moms who are at risk. The return on investment from those programs, which I started studying when I was in local government, mm -hmm. uh, is enormous. A very high return on investment for, for, by getting those professionals into work with at-risk moms to help them have healthy pregnancies, healthy deliveries, and a healthy child in the early years. We also need to look to uh, expanded early learning or preschool opportunities. 
in the state today, there are 19,500 children who are poor but who can't get into Head Start or ECAP, which is the state version of Head Start. Mm -hmm. We can expand access to Head Start and ECAP by restoring a higher share of the state budget to K-12 than it's currently receiving. Back in the 80s, over half of the state budget went to K-12. Today, it's down around in the low 40s. It shrank to a low of 38% a few years ago. As we expand the share of the budget going to K-12, leveraging the, the growing uh, budget in tax revenues that I mentioned before, the $11.3 billion, a portion of that needs to be dedicated to uh, Kate needs to be dedicated to early learning and we need to follow up on the work that the Department of Le Early Learning is doing now to create integration between kindergarten and preschool. Uh, this is uh, partly what the uh, race to the top for early learning uh, is going to fund with uh, Betty Hyde and the Department of Early Learning successfully winning a 60 million dollar race to the top grant. So we want to follow up on that, complete it, apply for more grant money as it becomes available, continue down that path so that children in child care have access to good early learning opportunities as well as children who are in preschool programs like Head Start or ECAP. But none of this is going to be possible until we change the direction the state's been going for a long time and decide that we are in fact going to put kids first when it comes to early learning, uh, uh, K-12 education and ultimately higher education as well. Uh, they have been receiving less than their share of growth in the state budget for a long time. Now it's their turn, or more, more to the point, it's our children's turn to receive more than their share of growth in the state budget so we can provide more resources for these programs. Thank you. You bet. Great, thank you. Now we'll turn to Diane from Seattle City Club. Diane? Women express great concern about health care costs and medical coverage. Tell us how you would approach the extension of Medicaid and women's health care coverage under health care reform. Well, of course, women's health care coverage needs to be included in uh, overall coverage in the safety net that includes Medicaid and that includes the basic health plan, which, well, currently, which will be replaced by Medicaid and by the health benefits exchange. So the state is already planning to transition to a system that relies on a combination of Medicaid and then the health benefits exchange. So those are two of the components that are important. Now under the new Medicaid threshold, one in three or almost one in three Washington residents will be eligible for Medicaid. I don't think that's what we should be aspiring to though. I mean, it'll be possible because the new threshold is 138 percent of the federal poverty level, but I don't think that's where everyone really wants to go. I think you see already in the current Medicaid population that uh, although 1.2 million are currently enrolled, another 545,000 Washington residents who are eligible for Medicaid aren't enrolled, and nearly 80 percent of them aren't enrolled because they have other coverage. And they clearly prefer to have that other coverage, typically from employers, as opposed to being in Medicaid. So let's make sure we work hard to uh, make it possible for as many people as possible to, to stay under their private coverage, which they, which they clearly prefer over uh, having to be signed up for Medicaid because that's their only option. For people and women who are uh, above the new 138% uh, threshold for Medicaid, we will have the health benefits exchange. This will entitle them to shop for health insurance for themselves and for their families in a marketplace of qualified health plans and to obtain on a sliding scale a subsidy for buying that health insurance. The subsidy will come in the form of an income tax credit. And the beauty of this is that they'll own their insurance. I, I really believe it's better for people to, to own their insurance than to be on welfare. And I think most people, given the opportunity to own their own, own their own insurance, would say the same thing. The third thing we have to do is to uh, you know, create or change policies in order to enhance the marketplace for insurance. 
instead of narrowing insurance options for individuals and for small businesses, we need to be expanding insurance options for individuals and small businesses. We want more companies competing to sell women and everybody else at every income level uh, affordable health insurance. We need small businesses to be able to afford to acquire health insurance for their employees. So we need to look at our state's policies and how they may inhibit uh, insurance choice and competition, may inhibit uh, cost competition that will lower insurance premiums, turn those policies in the direction of increasing competition so that competitive forces drive down premium costs and empower everyone, including women who need health insurance, to acquire it to be able to take care of themselves and their kids. Thank you. We also heard a great amount of concern from our Hangout registrants about the need for affordable housing. Rachel from the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance has a question for you on this. Rachel? Thank you. Uh, the Washington State Housing Trust Fund is the most significant investment that the state makes in homes that are affordable to low-income households. Over the last several years, the state investment in the trust fund has declined because of economic pressures, while those same economic pressures have increased the number of families struggling to keep a roof over their heads. As governor, what would you do to increase affordable housing opportunities for low-income families and individuals? Well, first of all, we have to protect the uh, trust fund from rates. Uh, it has been rated by the legislature. They have swept money from that fund as they have from so many dedicated funds uh, in order to plug holes in the budget. Now, that needs to stop. And uh, as we stop the bleeding, then we'll look for opportunities to restore funding to that fund. And here's one place I think we should be looking, the real estate excise tax. The real estate excise tax can be a really robust source of revenues for the state general fund. The problem with it is it can be very uneven. It can be real spiky depending on what's happening with real estate activity in the state. I've seen local governments and I've seen the state government treat increases in real estate excise tax revenue as somehow being permanent when in fact it often is only temporary. The increase is only temporary. It really is a spike and then it comes back down to some average. What I'd like to do is to take some of that, that spike, the, un, the, the part that may not repeat, and put it into funds like the Trust Fund for Housing. Because the State Housing Trust is uh, a, a, you know, a, a very effective fund for leveraging other dollars. It helps provide more affordable housing to a wide range of people because of that leverage. It grants money on a competitive basis uh, that encourages other grant monies to be provided or even potentially private investment. So I'll be looking for those opportunities to take dollars that may represent a temporary bump in revenues that shouldn't be spent on you know, permanent programs that have a bow wave, but could be put into a fund like the uh, State Housing Trust Fund, like the Public Works Trust Fund, which supports uh, uh, infrastructure development in, in uh, cities and counties, funds like that. And I think that, along with the fiscal discipline not to raid this tr housing trust fund in the future should provide stability and growth to benefit affordable housing for the people that you and your organization serve so well. Thank you. Beth. Thank you. As I mentioned before, reducing violence against women is a top priority nationally and locally. Grace from the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence has a particular question for you on this topic. Thank Grace. you. Um, domestic violence victims rely on supportive public policy to help them live their lives free from abuse. While arrest and prosecution of abusers is one aspect of public policy, victims also need policies that help them recover from abuse and to support themselves and their children. For example, some uh, policies might include fully implementing the family violence option in the Workforce TANF program, um, providing supportive services for non-abusing parents in the child protective system, Pay time off from work to address domestic violence, confidentiality protections for victims in public records, uh, strengthening oversight and training of professionals such as physicians, psychologists, and social service providers working with families that have faced domestic violence at home are some of them. Um, what will you do as governor to strengthen policy supporting victims in recovering from abuse and living their lives free from abuse? Well, uh, I'm going to continue to do the work I've been doing since I started volunteering uh, at Eastside East Domestic Violence Program uh, back in the mid-90s. 
Uh, I'm going to take my new role as governor and I'm going to leverage it to expand the awareness of domestic violence, to expand services for domestic violence survivors, to build stronger coalitions around domestic violence pre prevention, services, and uh, prosecution. Uh, in short, I'm going to take advantage of being governor to prioritize an issue I care very deeply about and have been working on steadily for the last, um, well, more than 15 years now. Uh, you know, it's, it's also about what I'm going to continue to do as a community leader. In other words, I've always been a volunteer in the community as well as being an elected, an elected official in the time that I've held elected office. If you look at my record, it isn't just like holding elected office, that's my community service. I've served on many nonprofit boards and as a volunteer with many agencies. I'm going to continue to do that as governor. Uh, we just celebrated the, uh, and conducted the 14th annual fundraising breakfast for LifeWire over in Bellevue. Uh, I co-founded that event in 1998 with uh, uh, Aggie Sweeney, who was the executive director at the time. Uh, and uh, I've uh, co-chaired it with my wife, Marilyn, uh, ever since then. And we're going to keep doing that. And I'm going to be looking for other opportunities like that as well. Uh, this is an issue that I put my personal time into because I think it's hugely important. But I'm going to put time into it as governor as well. For example, creating that domestic violence uh, advisory group. or Maybe we could give it a fancier name. We'll call it the domestic violence prevention and services cabinet, something like that. Grace, you're in charge of that subcommittee. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll, uh, we'll come up with a name that really conveys the import, the importance of this issue. And uh, you know, we'll be asking the DV community to nominate people to serve on it from all over the state, just like we have in the Attorney General's office. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question that was pre-submitted by Lacey, a mental health therapist in Seattle. She asks, a mental health parity law was passed in Washington to ensure mental health care access for all citizens. Unfortunately, the law has been difficult to implement due to insurance and funding barriers. All Washington citizens, including those vulnerable to homelessness, deserve quality mental care, mental health care equal to medical care. How will you help work toward this goal? Well, number one, I want to learn more about the insurance barriers that Lacey is referring to. It's not my area of expertise, and I'd like to know a lot more about that so we can see what can be done to address those barriers. Uh, number two, I'm going to continue to work with the uh, mental health advocacy organizations that I've been working with for the last uh, dozen years as a county council member and as attorney general to help elevate awareness of mental health in our community and the fact that it has not been a parity with, uh, with medical care, uh, other kinds of medical care, as it should be. Uh, number three, I think we need to uh, develop or adopt a model which more effectively integrates mental health into the overall provision of publicly funded health care. And a model for doing that that we ought to be looking at is Oregon's model, which seems to be having some success because it brings mental health care into uh, the discussion along with uh, primary care, for example, preventative care, uh, and so forth. And their, uh, as I understand it, their Medicaid model is uh, doing a better job of integrating those elements, uh, as, is other, as are other aspects of their public health funding, doing a better job of integrating those elements uh, to bring mental health to true parity. And we need to do this. You know, I've, I have uh, I've seen the King County Jail become, at least when I was on the county council, the third largest mental health facility or institution in our state. I've been to uh, dozens of hospitals. They all have emergency departments. And they all tell me when I visit them that uh, they are just struggling with the mentally ill arriving in the EDs because they have nowhere else to go. So I understand the, the issue, uh, and the severity of the issue, and I'm um, committed to making progress on it uh, as governor. Thank you. Uh, now to Diane of Seattle City Club. In light of the McCleary decision, prioritizing education funding and your own commitment to increase funding for higher education, how will you balance all the worthy causes and issues that we've talked about today in policies that matter to women and families in our, in our state? All right, so I'm going to ask for a little more time on this question because this is pretty involved. 
this doesn't lend itself easily to three minutes, but I'll try to keep it as close to three minutes as I can. Okay. All right. So, so let's. That's why I was trying to be quicker on some of the other ones, being really concise, because I knew this one was coming. And this <laughs> is the issue. You, you absolutely nailed it on the head. This is really key uh, as a factor affecting our budget making decisions going forward for the next, uh, you know, eight years at least. So let's start by understanding where we are. A lot of people talk about McCleary, but they may not be aware of what it really stands for, what it means. McCleary resulted from a couple of trends in how uh, K-12 education has been funded by our state over the last 20 to 30 years. First of all, we've seen the share of the state budget going to public schools steadily declining since the 1980s. In the 80s, we hit a peak, at least for that period, of over 50% of the state general fund budget going to K-12. A few years ago, that had declined all the way to 38%. Now, to put this in perspective, if our public schools and our higher education system, which back in the 80s had 16% of the state budget, in other words, back in the 80s, two-thirds of the general fund budget went to education from kindergarten to graduate school, if they had simply maintained their share of the budget, over the last 20 years, instead of shrinking dramatically as they have, there would be $4 billion more in the state budget today going to our public schools, and uh, some of that would be going to higher ed. And I'm guessing we wouldn't be under a court order right now that resulted from a unanimous ruling of the Supreme Court, which found that we are violating the Constitution by not adequately funding our public schools. The second feature of McCleary, which is key to understanding it, has to do with uniformity of funding, where the money comes from. The Supreme Court ruled 9-0 not only that we're not adequately funding our public schools, and, and by the way, uh, Education Week reports that we rank in the, among the bottom five states in America in per-student funding. They're also saying that we're not providing funding from the state at the level we're supposed to, as opposed to local school districts. In other words, we're over-relying on local school levies to fund education. When I arrived in Washington State as a high school student back in the 70s, in the late 70s, the very late 70s, all right, I'm not that young. But anyway, when I arrived here in the late 70s, 10% of school district budgets were provided by local school levies, by, by the school districts themselves, and 90% came from the state, state general fund. That now has declined to where, you know, where well, it's, well, I should say, that number's gone up to 28%. So now 28% of the cost, on average, across the state, of public education is borne by local school districts, by local levies. The courts pointed out this violates the Constitution because the state isn't even funding basic education for fully. We're not fully funding all of the costs of supplies, school transportation, uh, principal salaries, and so forth. And now we're under court order to do something about that. This means that the uh, amount of education cost being borne by local levies has to be reduced. And the number that appears to be the target number, if you read the Su Supreme Court, in between the lines, or you listen to what the folks in Olympia and the legislature are saying, it appears to be it needs to go down to somewhere around 10%. Maybe it could be 12%. But that's a pretty big drop from 28%. Just to put that in perspective for you, to, to replace school levy fund, local school levy funding so that instead of 28%, only 12 to 10 to 12% is funded by local levies, you need to add uh, about, you need to replace about $1.7 billion of levy money, of local levy money. That's a big number. Now, add on top of that what we're going to need to meet the standard of adequacy of amply funding education for all children in the state, which is required by Article 9 of the state constitution. Superintendent of Public Instruction Randy Dorn came out the other day and said he thinks that's about $4 billion of additional funding. So that's the challenge that we're facing. Now, in this race for governor, you have a pretty strong contrast. Uh, Congressman Inslee refuses to say 
how he's going to fund it. I mean, he doesn't provide any kind of finance plan. He doesn't attach any dollars to his plan whatsoever. He simply says, hey, don't worry. We're going to have a lot of job growth. We're going to be lean in state government. That's going to fix it. That's not very persuasive. It's not persuasive to the education reform community. It's not persuasive to a lot of, uh, a lot of folks who pay attention to policymaking in Olympia and so forth. On the other hand, I've laid out a pretty specific way that we could get there. Let me be clear, it's not going to be easy, but this is how we would do it. We would basically acknowledge the fact that the state budget in revenues is forecast to grow $11.3 billion over the next eight years. That's the governor's budget forecast. It's the mid-range forecast. It's not wildly optimistic. 36.5% over eight years compares, for example, to 32% tax revenue growth in four years during Governor Gregoire's first term before the recession. So I think OFM, the state budget office, is being you know, fairly clear-eyed about that. But the question is, what do we do with that growth? And how do we make sure that enough of it is available for education that we can comply with the Supreme Court's order, but more than that, that so that we can do what we know we're supposed to be doing. I mean, put aside the issue of a Supreme Court order for a second. We know we're supposed to be adequately funding our schools. We know that it's wrong that we're among the bottom five states in America in per-student funding. We understand that it isn't just about funding either, that it's about reform and innovation, that it's unacceptable that only 4% of Seattle public high school graduates who enroll in South Seattle Community College can do first-year community college math according to the assessment test they provide by any measure, that we have an achievement gap that is getting bigger for many kids. We're one of the only states that has a, a growing achievement gap between low-income kids, largely children of color, and the rest of the students. We know this is wrong. And we, the adults, have to accept responsibility for it, have to be accountable, accountable for it. Now, I'm not going to go into the litany of, of reforms and innovations we need right now, because that wasn't part of the question. But if you're interested in seeing what they should look like, take a look at the A-plus education plan. You can find it online. It was developed by the, the Excellent Schools Now Coalition, the broadest coalition of, uh, around any public policy issue in our state today. So please take a look at it. I think you'll, you'll be interested in what it contains. But on the funding side, we have to acknowledge the fact that if we want to, you know, if, not if we want to, because we must do what we, we know we're supposed to do anyway, and we must comply with the Supreme Court's order, we're going to have to take a lot of that growth and revenue and devote it to education. So one way to do that is to take non-education spending and allow it to grow but not allowed to grow more than, say, 6% of biennium. That's inflation plus population. That means some parts of non-education spending would grow faster than 6%, and some parts would grow more slowly than 6%. It would be the average. It's not a hard cap on every category of non-education spending. So some kinds of healthcare spending might go up faster than 6%, for example. But you take the revenue above that overall 6% for non-education spending, and you put it into education. And using the budget numbers from the governor's office, what it shows you is that by the end of this decade, not only do you, have you allowed K-12 uh, funding to grow with, by its share, you know, by its 6%, because it would get that baseline funding, but the money on top of that would provide an additional 3.6 to $3.7 billion for our public schools. With that money, we could, for example, reduce class size for kindergarten, first, and second grade to 17 students. We could pay for uh, early learning for the 19,500 poor children who can't get into ECAP, the state version of Head Start. And we can fund other improvements that we know we need. Uh, so that's my approach, is to say it's not easy, but it's important. It's time to put the kids first. It's time for them to get the education funding they deserve. And it's time to do that in the context of a reformed, innovative public education system that gets more results and better results for the money that we are spending, which is exactly what other states are doing. For example, the 12 states that finished in the money, so to speak, in President Obama's race to the, comp uh, race to the top competition. In that competition, we came in near the bottom, 32nd out of 36 states. Did you hear a big outcry about that in Olympia? No. It's time for people to stand up and say, that is not acceptable. 
and to put our money where our commitment is, where we know we need to be, as well as to reform and innovate. Thank you for that very complete answer. Um, but it looks, it looks like we've come to the end of our time today. While this conversation may be over, there are still many conversations happening and ways to stay engaged with Fire Steel's advoca advocacy community. October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and Fire Steel is joining a Facebook awareness campaign. Visit the Fire Steel Facebook page and take our quiz to test your knowledge of domestic violence in Washington State. Fire Steel will be exploring connections between domestic violence and family homelessness throughout the month of October. The closer we come to ending domestic violence, the closer we are to ending family homelessness. We are also inviting you to check out our interactive Fire Steel website at firesteelwa.org. Register with your Facebook or Twitter account and get plugged into our efforts to end family homelessness. Upon registering, you'll be able to receive advocacy alert messages based on where you live, in addition to many other advocacy features. But even more than features, Fire Steel is about a community of advocates and concerned citizens who want to see women and families thrive, and we want to hear your voice. And now it's time for some thank yous. Thank you for each, to each of us, our roundtable participants, for posing such good questions. Thank you to our online community for being so active and submitting your questions for the candidate. And thank you, candidate McKenna, for sharing your views on these women's issues. You're, you're I want welcome, but please just call me Rob if it's okay. <laughs> okay, Rob, fine. thank you. It sounds a little <laughs> too formal, but thank you. I want to remind you that we hung out with candidate Jay on Wednesday. <laughs> No, no, no. If you if you like to see both of these both of these videos, Rob and Jay, they are available on the YWCA <laughs> Fire Steel websites. There are only a few short four weeks, to be exact, to the election. So please take a look and share these videos with your friends. Thank you again, and bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.